Hello everyone, Jared here, and in today's video, we're continuing our trip in Chaoxing Village, beginning with our breakfast in the morning of day two. All right, we are in Chaoxing for our first morning breakfast, and here is what we've got. We had an absolutely huge meal of watermelon, corn, manto, or in other words, steamed bread, and also these noodles that you see here, which were delicious. All right, time to have some. Mm-hmm, this is what I need in the morning. <laughs> but after that, we headed just a few doors down from our hotel and saw this wonderful sight of rice paddy fields slowly being revealed to us through the dissipating fog. It was still early enough in the morning that people were still working outside in the fields. And because the weekend had just ended, that meant that most of the tourists were not going to be in the city today. So we got to see what most of the citizens' lives were normally like. So at first you think, okay, this is all a tourist trap kind of thing. And then you take a few steps out and you realize how small the tourist trap part is. And you start understanding they are building this around who they are. So it isn't just this new tourism brought in by the high-speed rail. It is, in fact, a thriving community who's trying to take advantage of that new high-speed rail to get themselves out of poverty. And it appears, it appears to be working. Most of the year, the people of Chaoxing will spend their time still practicing farming in the fields, carrying bushels of whatever crops to the city, where they'll eventually be sold. And many of the households around Chaoxing also have dogs, not just because they want to have some cute pet, but because they help in the process of keeping a lot of the pests away. And boy, were there a lot of dogs here. But. Anyways, once we had our fill of looking at the fields, we headed back to our hotel, got our stuff, and began our main part of the trip today, which was going to be heading just a short ways up on a hill via another shuttle bus to a place called Titian, which was going to be a village where we would supposedly be able to see a whole bunch of rice paddies. The hotel owner, the one who you see walking next to me here, was the one who told us about this place and we decided to take him up on his recommendation and head it on up. And here we are at the top of uh, Titian, is what they call this area, where they have all the rice paddies. Right now, you don't see much water because everything's growing out of them right now. But what do you think of the view? Aren't these terraces quite the sight? Well, I'm sure that many of you are also wondering why someone would build these terraces in the first place. And the reasons are actually quite simple. One being that there's not very much flat land for them to farm in, in the south parts of China. And two, this form of farming is actually very beneficial for them because it prevents a lot of erosion. But I've always been stunned by how people can just go up and down these rice paddy terraces day after day since it involves so much climbing. Most people will tell you that if you're going to go see rice terraces, then you should probably go sometime between mid-April to late June, if you want to see them while they're still greener and have lots of crops growing inside of them. During July to mid-September, the time while we were here, that's when things start to turn toward the golden side, and crops soon are harvested afterwards. But can you imagine all the work that must go into picking all these crops when they don't have the accessibility of large machinery to do so? It's really quite the undertaking. But perhaps even more impressive than the sight of all these terraces was being able to look down below and see the village where we'd started our journey earlier in the morning, nestled between the hills on either side. So once we were finally done taking in this view, we continued our way up the hillside into the village, coming across a map that showed us that we had quite a bit of walking to do so we followed this lady up the road, noticing a whole lot of work that was going on, particularly construction, as well as a lot of meal preparation. Whether what we were seeing was chicken or fish being cleaned, or perhaps most unexpectedly, as you can see in the bowls here off to the side, someone was preparing snails. 
and we even got to see a family try to prepare some of the snails, which they did by clipping off some part on the top of the snail shells, which, after looking up later why they do that, is because it makes it so that the snails will cook better. So yes, some people in China do in fact use snails for cooking, and most of them come from the rice paddy fields all around. As we continued our way up into the village, it was getting harder and harder because there was a lot of uphill climbing, but if you're not in shape to do it, there's always this donkey that I guess you can ride up and down if you want to do so. Eventually, we found our way to the top where this pagoda was, and we were greeted by this lady. <laughs> She likes our beards. <laughs> the village really seemed like quite a nice and friendly place, and you could definitely tell that the place was developing. The children, in particular, were having a lot of fun up here playing in all the various pools of water. The sanitation was not necessarily the best. However, there was one thing that we found very odd here that the children were playing with. Snakes! At first, we weren't sure what it was that they were holding here, but upon closer inspection, we learned what they really were. So, if you have a fear of snakes, maybe this isn't the best thing for you to do. But if you're a child and you're interested in snakes, I guess you can come here to play with snakes all you want. Although, the snakes may not really like it. So the water is coming from up there somewhere. Comes down into there. Then goes to where the kids are playing with those snakes. And in case you wanted to know, yes, they are real. So after we had our fill of looking at children playing with snakes in the water and trying to understand the curious water infrastructure, I decided I would climb up these stairs you see behind onto the hill above and found myself in these rice paddies while my father stayed down below. This was my first time being so close to all these rice paddies on this trip. And it had been almost a decade since the last time I was so close to rice paddies. And aren't they quite the sight? I think the countryside in Guizhou and Guangxi are definitely worth seeing if you get the chance. Because this is the China that mo most people want to see, but they don't get the chance to if they just stay in the bigger cities. But it is harder to go and see these if you don't have any Chinese skills. Dad is somewhere down there, at the bottom of this path. I think I've been up here long enough by myself for him to do a old man video or something. The gate that leads back down to the village, where I'm sure he's waiting for me. Just down there, not too far. So, what old man videos was he shooting in the meantime? Well, he was making note of the hairstyles that the various women of the Dong minority had, as well as the clothing that they were wearing. He watched as they sold various objects to tourists, particularly food, and eventually he got bored of doing this too, and decided he'd go off to the side and start looking at more of the buildings, to see the architecture and construction of them up close. Of course, some of the buildings are beautifully constructed, the standout in particular being the pagoda, of course. But not all the buildings are necessarily new looking and impressive. Some of them are not in quite so good of a shape. I strongly suggest you watch your step around here, especially if you're going into that side door. Uh, a misstep could be a doozy. So even though some of the buildings may not be quite up to building standards, at least they're being provided with access to electricity that they wouldn't have had even 10 years ago. So things are definitely on the up and up. Time for me to, to find Jared. So shortly after that, I came walking down from the steps above and met up with my dad before we headed on down back towards where we were dropped off at the bottom of the village. But before that, there was this donkey that we happened to notice, and we wanted to just take some videos of seeing who would possibly ride it. And unfortunately, one lady got kicked. That's really gotta hurt. Don't stand behind a donkey. That's pretty much good advice for anyone. So once we reached the bottom of the village, we got on the back of a golf cart 
and shot this as we slowly made our way down towards the village proper. And looking at these roads just makes you wonder, how much will these places change as China continues to grow wealthier over the coming course of the next decade? Well, we were eventually dropped off back at the gateway at the top of the village, and walked our way down the path you see right here over to our hotel before dropping some things off, heading back out, and checking out more of Zhaoxing Village that we didn't get to see yesterday. Starting with where the big banquet was outside of our hotel yesterday. So this is the communal stove where a lot of wood was burned yesterday. You can see where the wood goes up through the chimneys right there. And in the middle is where they were cooking a whole bunch of stuff yesterday and it looks like nobody is very keen on cleaning. Mm-mm. Doesn't that look great? You'd hope all this would be cleaned out right after the cooking was over. But anyways, we moved on from there. So like with a lot of other minority villages, they have, on their main streets, become very commercialized here in Zhaoxing. But, the moment you step off of the main path, that's where you start getting the more actual living kind of conditions that they have on their regular, everyday basis. And one of those places just off the beaten path was this, the farmer's market, where most of the villagers will go for all their various wants and needs. And yet again, the meat wasn't preserved in the most sanitary of ways. But we did come across this surprise right after, where a few men were working on constructing more of these wooden instruments. One of them would place the bamboo tubes and test the sound of the instrument, while the others were carving away at the bamboo to make them the proper shape. Here's a little sample of what we saw. Moving on from there, we saw a sign that mentioned a exhibition center highlighting the culture of the local Dong minority, so we headed on over. Well, we found the Dong Culture Exhibition Center. Alright, we are going inside the Dong Museum here. And they actually have English for this, the tourism toilet. So here it was, the Dong Exhibition Center which really is uniquely designed unlike any museum we'd ever seen before. And at the beginning, they have several shops that have lots of different clothing made by the minority that you can choose to buy if you are so inclined. One of the women who worked there was even in the process of sewing some of the clothing, which we were lucky enough to be able to see. But moving on from there, we noticed that the entire upper floor was closed for renovations. But there were some exhibits that were still open, although the English wasn't necessarily the best because they'd often have English at the top of the description and then none underneath, so we had no idea what we'd be looking at. Well, it appears we finally found some exhibits. So what was this first exhibit, you might ask? Well, it was the various tools and goods of the people who lived in the village particularly the different types of baskets, as well as their uses, of which there were many. You need to come and just see how people live day to day in the more rural communities. Just look at this wall. I can't imagine what all the various purposes and uses are for these baskets, but apparently each one has its own purpose. And right next to that, there was a section dedicated to the various festivals that are held throughout the year in the area, and we even got to take this short clip of a video of one of their celebrations. Seeing this makes me really wish that we'd happen to come here at the time when these celebrations occur yet again. But it wasn't to be for us on this trip. After that, it was back to the Dong Minority's clothing, which typically come in blue and black colors, and are made of various brocades and embroidery, before moving on to see particularly colorful works of brocade. What do you think of some of these colors and designs?
little interesting. They have a room that projects the brocade on the walls and you get to see everything up close. Well, if you're not covering it like I am, that is. But it wasn't only the brocade and the clothing that we got to see here. It was also all the different types of jewelry that people wear in various festive activities, which are generally made of silver. Whether it's necklaces, handwear, headwear, back ornaments, waist ornaments, leg wrappings, bandages, or even on their shoes. There's a lot of different types of jewelry that are worn that can really weigh someone down. But it really is quite beautiful. Following the jewelry exhibit, we found ourselves outside in a courtyard yet again where they highlighted the actual creation process of the brocade, which I thought was exciting to see. This started actually with the process of dyeing. So first you see the indigo dye that was in the baskets there, and up above all the various patterns that are created out of using it. But not only that, we also got to see the whole process from when they start heating up the dye, putting cloth inside of the barrels for the dyeing process, and then taking it out to dry. Supposedly, they can dye it up to at least 20 times in order to make it more bright and shiny. The dye itself is combined with rice wine and lime, and the mixture is heated well before it's removed and it oxidates into the blue color that you're seeing. And in order to keep some of the parts of the cloth from getting that blue color, they will often put some kind of wax over the parts of the cloth that they don't want to be dyed, which then reacts with the dye to keep that section of the cloth from changing color. So once it's all done, they place it outside underneath the sun either flat or hanging it up somewhere, and let it dry for a while. We got there just in time to be able to see this piece completed, and doesn't it look great? There was also this little one on the side too, but after that, we went to another shop that happened to highlight more of these blue and white designs all over the place. Even on the pole in the middle of the store, and we really struggled with not buying anything here, before moving on and seeing what else was here. And the last thing we noticed here off to the side was this small room with people sitting at tables. So after the embroidery shop, we apparently found there is a place where you get to go ahead and make your own. So if you're someone who's interested in making your own design for the Dong Minorities fabric, then I guess you can come here and they may even help you out with doing it. I know that because, at least in one case, there was this child who had to get a lot of help from one of the ladies because he wasn't really very good at staying in the lines by himself. Something I also struggled with quite a bit as a kid. So when I was looking at that room, what was my father doing, you might ask? Well, this apparently. Anyways, that was it for our time here at this Dong Minority Exhibition Hall. And next, we were back outside looking at the rest of the village that we hadn't seen yet. And Zhaoxing Village really is a very cinematic place. Probably one of the most beautiful villages I'd been to in all of China. Maybe I liked it so much this day because so few people were here, since it was during the work day. And crops from the morning, particularly chilies, were placed out to dry all over the place. Something that I'd never seen before. But makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. But it wasn't just peppers and various other plants that were left out to dry. There were a wide variety of things that people would place outside their houses in small baskets to dry off underneath the sun. And this also included a lot of types of cloth and leather that had just recently been dyed. You can even see where some of this left stains earlier on. The few people who were still working outside were really interesting to watch, whether it was sifting through meal, watching them sew and knit by hand, or perhaps, most interestingly, this. This woman who we spotted from quite a ways away, hammering away at something, and since we couldn't tell what it was from far away, we had to get closer. Apparently, what she was doing was beating leather repeatedly over and over in order to make it soft and malleable for whatever it would go into. Also, look at that little machine. i would never seen a small homemade hammering machine like this before. So that feat of engineering I thought was pretty cool. Occasionally, while watching her, she would scare us because she'd reach her hand underneath the hammer before pulling it back out. 
but I guess the reason she could do this is because she was quite experienced and had been doing this for quite a while. Doing this day after day and year after year will definitely build up your arm strength. And if looking at everything else that people are doing outside isn't enough for you, you can always just take pictures of the scenery, which we also did a lot of here too, as pretty much everywhere is quite picturesque. And I think rather than talk any more about it, I'll just go ahead and let you enjoy a little bit of what we saw here. Now one thing you might miss if you happen to come here and don't pay close attention is if you go into these bridges over the water and look up. They have murals of various stories and cultural icons related to the Dong minority that look amazing. So make sure to always look up because you never know what you might miss otherwise. I'm sure that there was still quite a bit we had not seen throughout our time here at Jiaoxing Village because it really is a lot larger than it seems. Although staying here for a couple of days does give you a small glimpse into what it's like for the villagers living their daily lives here. And all of this walking around today had made us exhausted and also really thirsty. So we headed off to look for more of that juice drink that I'd come to love since we went to the Xijiang Miao village. And after finding one shop that sold it, here it was. So this is our delicious drink that we need more of. Gonna miss this once we leave these minority areas in Guizhou. Hopefully they have it in Guilin too. And in Wuhan. I could use it. Alright. We have the drink that we need. Our hero of the day. And at this point, it was starting to get close to dinner time. So, we went back to the main street area, looking at the various restaurants on the sides of the road, trying to figure out what exactly we wanted at this time. And one of the things that you'll notice right away is, there are a whole bunch of options. Whether it's big restaurants or tiny stalls that sell all kinds of foods. We ended up going behind some of these stalls into the back, where there was one restaurant that looked like it had some air conditioning. So, we decided to go on inside that one. We're sitting inside our air-conditioned restaurant, waiting for our two dishes. One's a soup that is made by the, the specifically the Dong minority here, and the other one is just a eggplant dish. So we were going to have a light meal of green beans and eggplant, which turned out to be one of my favorite dishes from the trip. And if I have the chance, maybe I'll try to replicate this at home too sometime. And also this sour vegetable soup. Looking inside, you can see tomatoes and cabbage, but the special thing is that everything you see inside was grown here locally in the village. We enjoyed our short, nice meal before heading back out yet again, one last time for the evening, over to the rice paddies on the outskirts of the village. And this time, we decided we wanted to get a little bit closer to seeing what the paddies really looked like. So if you've never seen what rice paddies looked like before, here you go. things I think people don't often realize about all the water underneath rice paddies is that there are often fish placed underneath, which are placed there in order to keep down the bug population. So these rice paddy fields are not just for rice, but they're also technically aquariums and also a place to get fish from for meals. But once we were done looking around this part of the village one last time, we headed back inside, noticing this man raking away at stones underneath the bridge to smooth it out for the water flow, before coming across this really long table, which we didn't understand why it was here. 
but after a short time later, we came to realize that this was actually for some children in a room right across the way, where a lot of them were participating in some school activities. But one thing that never ceased to amaze us was looking at these pagodas all throughout the village, with all their bright colors and murals, many of which had been around for at least 200 years. These are probably what I'll remember most from Chaoxing Village as time goes on. But, as I just said, right next to there, and inside one of the rooms, was a group of children being taught some songs about the Dong minority while they were here on a school field trip, and we were able to catch a small snippet of it. <laughs> and after that, we continued walking around until it eventually turned dark, at which point we headed back to our hotel and we were done with Zhaoxing. So I hope you enjoyed this video of our time spent in Zhaoxing Village, and in the next video we'll be coming to you from our next destination, Guilin City. So I hope you're looking forward to seeing it. Until next time! Thank you again for watching this video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so. Also, please share this channel with others so we can make the channel grow together as I continue to put out more videos.